All right, all right, everybody. Uh, LSU football practice report. Um, Smoky Investment Team is uh, is brought to you by, and uh, I'm real excited today. I got Zach Nagy uh, with LSU Country on SI, and um, he's been out there at every practice, and um, uh, he's one of my favorite guys in the uh, in the LSU media, and he's got a good pulse on what he's seeing out there, and. Uh, Zach, welcome in, man. What, what did you think of this morning's practice? And, and um, of course, also we had Blake Baker this morning. Um, been kind of taking some notes on what all he had to say, but um, what's up? Yeah, man. Appreciate you having me on. And it's always fun talking to Big Mike. So this morning was, you know, you, you kind of get what you, you kind of get what you get for these 20 minute media viewings. And this morning was a, a pretty good one, in my opinion. The, the a, a main topic of conversation is always going to be this quarterback battle for the backup slot. And it's between A.J. Swan and Ricky Collins right now. And, you know, Joe Sloan brought in A.J. Swan from Vanderbilt, and he's a pretty solid pocket passer um, right there. And the, the dynamic between him and Ricky Collins is super different because Ricky Collins kind of offers you that Jaden Daniels-like package just because he's mobile and dynamic and he's still growing as a passer. But the two of them are battling back and forth for that QB2 slot, and it's been, it's been pretty fun to watch. Today we saw Ricky Collins take a majority of the second-team snaps we saw AJ Swan get some second team snaps too, but that's one that really has caught a lot of the media's eyes, and it's really caught my eye too, especially on an offense where you're returning a majority of your talent. You have Josh Williams as your running back. Your offensive line is the exact same, except you insert DJ Chester as your starting center. So if you're looking for kind of a quote unquote controversy or something to look into on the offense, it's going to be who's going to take over that backup slot. And today we saw Ricky Collins take really a majority of those QB2 snaps. And the the other thing that a lot of us are talking about, and me specifically, is I've been super, super high on P.J. Woodland. I bought stock in the early enrollee. I'm really happy with what he's doing. And today we saw him take first team snaps on the opposite side of Aston Stamps. That's that's something that's super interesting to me, Mike, just because he's so damn young, man. He's a, he's a senior. He's supposed to be a senior in high school right now and he's supposed to be taking – should, should, be, should be getting his tux rental uh, for yeah. prom. Like he should be just getting ready for prom right now, and, and he's sitting over here really flying up this depth chart, just skyrocketing. And – Today he took first team snaps alongside Ashton Stamps at cornerback. So it was a pretty solid media viewing today. And I, I was really impressed with what PJ Woodland kind of brings to the table. And clearly this coaching staff is too, because JV and Toviano sitting there taking second team snaps. But we're gonna see that's gonna be a battle that goes into the fall and it's it's gonna be all off season. Well, look, we we've seen many times in, in the last 20 plus years that freshmen have come in and made a statement, whether it be at corner or safety. And um, it's not out of the realm of possibility, but you can also flip it around and say, man, what does it say about the quarterback, quarterback room that a freshman's come in and it looks like he can win that job? Um, but my whole take on that cornerback spot, and same thing with safety, is that there's some safety in numbers there. The fact that they've got, you know, what they've got on campus, I just, you got to believe that they're going to find some uh, working solutions there uh, and have some and guys who can, uh, you know, compete in, in the SEC in one-on-ones with receivers, uh, and, and particularly with your safeties, not knowing what that defense front's going to look like, you're going to need some guys who are sure tacklers. Um, but yeah, it, it's that's going to be very interesting to see. I, I know Coach Baker said earlier that you know one of the things that uh, really, and he knows it because he's been here before, uh, having that offense simplified where you don't have guys overthinking it. Um, and he wants those guys flying freely is with his word. And, um, so I, I like the, the, the sound of that, but, um, I also want to go back to what you just said about the corner quarterback battle for, for, for the second. Um, do I think that there's, um, you know, a little bit of, you know, I don't want to say politics, that's not the word, but certainly, you know, Ricky Collins, uh, you would think uh, is owed the chance to legitimately compete for the for the number two job, and that means dividing up the reps evenly, um, and then you know, and and I think that's what they're doing. Um, but I think a lot of people immediately thought when you went to the portal and got a quarterback that that meant that that guy was automatically going to be the number two. And I don't think Ricky Collins is going to sit down and allow that to happen without a fight. Completely agreed. I think Ricky Collins is the type of guy who you know he's from Baton Rouge. He's got that. Preston likes to say it all the time. He's got that dog in him. So he's the type of guy who's truly going to come in and compete day in and day out. And he, he's certainly been doing that. And Joe Sloan is a workhorse and Ricky Collins is a workhorse. So it's, it's kind of a match made in heaven for both of them. And we've seen Ricky Collins is throwing motion. A lot of things change for him as mechanics. And that kind of is a testament to the work that Joe Sloan's willing to put in with him. So 
kind of piggybacking off of what you said, yeah, man, of course. I think Ricky Collins is going to sit back here and, and he's not going to go down without a fight. And then you fast forward and look at somebody like AJ Swan, and this is a guy who has SEC experience. I know Vanderbilt isn't the most premier program in the SEC when it comes to football, but at the end of the day, playing in the SEC is kind of playing in the SEC. You know, you're getting some big time snaps, big time reps under your belt. He did it as a youngster, and now he's coming to Baton Rouge. And I, I really think that this is going to be a fun one to watch. Who do who do I think is going to win it? I really couldn't tell you until fall camp because I think this is going to be one that battles all the way into fall camp. But I, I think Ricky Collins isn't going to go down without a fight. And uh, it, would, it would put a chip on my shoulder if, if Joe Sloan and the co- coaching staff went out and got another quarterback. So I think we're seeing him really put his head down and work and try to win that, you know, QB2 spot. Well, and look, uh, I think it was last night's show at Buddy where, you know, I'm, I think you've got a, a com- competitive situation there. And, man, I, you know, I know a lot of people were looking at maybe some of Hurley's senior film and some of the games and maybe weren't blown away at times. But, man – when I watch him, that kid is soaking a lot of it, and I know they're happy with him. Um, uh, he's soaking it all up like a sponge, and I, th- I think he's uh, he's another one that when Bryce Underwood arrives at midterm, that I don't think he's going to lay down either. I, I think you've got competitions uh, coming there, and, of course, what, we're, we, we, what we've been talking about. So Yeah, and I, I, think I don't, don't want to cut you off, but the Colin Hurley thing is something that's taken me by surprise. I'll be the first to tell you that when I watched his senior tape, I was not that impressed. I, I watched it and I kind of sat back and I was like, okay, what are we getting here? Like, I, I wasn't necessarily confused, but I was sitting here thinking, okay, like, let's see what this kid can develop develop into. And then he arrives on campus at 16 years of age. He just turned 17 and he's slinging that thing. I mean, this kid does not look like your average 17 year old. So I've been very impressed with what Hurley brings to this quarterback room as well. And I, I think it's a problem that, is a good problem to have. You have four quarterbacks that are solid. You have your true starter in Nussmeyer, two capable backups, and then your youngster in Colin Hurley right there who's soaking everything in like a sponge, like you were saying. So I'm thoroughly impressed with what Joe Sloan's done in this quarterback room. And then obviously it goes without saying that you get Bryce Underwood in that room next January and all things just turn crazy. Yeah, and the thing about Hurley is I'm not suggesting that um, he's going to be a guy that can win a job and it might take him two years. Right. Um, but he's not a guy where he's just going to be because of when he came in and what's coming in that he's just going to fall by the way. I don't see that. I I, I just don't. Um, and look, when, when, at his age and, and graduating from high school a year early and what he did at the Elite 11 last summer, you can talk about his high school team and his surrounding cast and the competition um, and, and kind of come up with some reasons why maybe some of it, the film his senior year wasn't what it was. You thought it might be, um, but again, I like what he said. Anything on Blake ba- from Blake Baker today that uh, you, that really stood out to you other than what we've already mentioned? I think really just talking about the usage of Harold Perkins. I think that's what the LSU fan base wants to hear. I think it's what everybody – it's going to be the talk of the town until they lace up their cleats against USC in September. It's how is Harold Perkins going to be used? How do you get the most out of Harold? How do you really make him the player that he was as a true freshman? And I think Blake Baker kind of harped on that in a, in a good way for a while just saying that he's going to allow him to be free. He's going to take him under his wing and just allow Harold to be Harold. Uh, We saw him as a true freshman, really. It was like see ball, get ball. But now it's kind of learning the techniques, the fundamentals, everything that comes with it as a football player in order for it to translate to the next level. So I was really impressed with what Blake Baker was talking about for Harold Perkins, just talking about the overall scheme, the plan, and how they want to utilize him moving forward. So I, uh, we all saw how Blake Baker made Demo Clark into a Buckus Award finalist linebacker. I see no reason why he can't do the same with somebody like Harold Perkins, who's truly just an athletic specimen. So you put him wherever you want on your defense and he's going to shine. So one year in the system as a linebacker, you're going into year two with somebody like Blake Baker. I'm really intrigued to see what he can do. And it it sounds like Coach Baker is really intrigued as well. But, you know, you also have some skeptics out there that are maybe a little bit, you know, wondering that uh, will he ever be a true inside linebacker? And and that's a problem. I can I can completely get on that exact wavelength. I I'm a guy who sits here and is like, what do you do with a hybrid like him? He can truly do it all. Where's his bread and butter going to be at? Is it going to be at the inside linebacker? Is it going to be as an edge rusher kind of undersized? I'm really intrigued to see what they do here. And I think year three in Baton Rouge is going to be the telling, telling sign for it. And I think Blake Baker's the perfect candidate to get Perkins, you know, out of his shell. All right. Well, these uh, practice reports are brought to you by the Smokey investment team. What is something you could do with your money that would be meaningful to you? Do you have goals you want to reach? Do you feel like you need some guidance to realize those goals? 
At the Smoky Investment Team, we help people set their goals and work towards them. Over 50 years of experience doing just that. If you want to get serious about reaching your financial potential, give them a call at 318-448-3201. That's 318-448-3201. Securities Advisory Services offered through LPL Financial, a registered investment advisor, member FINRA slash SIPC. Again, uh, Bart and Brian Smokey, both LSU grads, father and son, and uh, been knowing them for uh, 25 years. Just fantastic people. And um, right there on Versailles Boulevard in Alexandria. And um, now's the time where you really need some people to help you get ready for retirement. Uh, get your uh, SEPs and 401ks and uh, all the different uh, things that, uh, that they can put together for you at the Smoky Investment Team. Um, Zach, this LSU women's basketball thing, I'm going to switch. I might meander a little bit. This LSU women's basketball brouhaha with uh, the governor and the, the national anthem. Uh, you cover them. You go to the, the LSU women. You're at all the LSU sporting events. Um, you know what do you, you see. You know what's been the policy. And it was it was uh, when I saw that uh, come out about uh, halfway through the second half and start making this rounds on social media. Um, I, I I knew it was uh, it was going to sit for a while and. Sure enough, it's it's we're now three days uh, after LSU's loss to Iowa, and it's it's still festering out there. Uh, and a lot of people have, you know, got the true story as to what LSU has done, uh, how it's done, and why. And um, but you still have some people that are trying to make uh, noise about it, and 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 I think really it's an effort to damage uh, Kim Mulkey and the program. One hundred percent. I think when you have somebody of Kim Mulkey's stature somebody who's just so prominent in the basketball space, you're going to do anything to try to tear somebody down like her. And she's, she's a hall of famer and she's a click generator. You put Kim Mulkey's name on anything and you're going to get clicked. So you try to find any type of tiny thing that she does and spin it off into something that it may or may not be. And for you and me who go to all these women's basketball games, we know the protocols at the 12 minute mark. They go back into the locker room every single time. It's been and I'm standing on the corner. I stand on the corner of that court yeah. with my hand over my heart and I do the national anthem. Then I immediately turn and then I wait to see the girls come out of the locker room. Then we look to see what Kim Mulkey's wearing. She walks uh, right past me and goes, hugs the opposing court. Every single Coach time. Comes back the other way and she sits in the same chair, crosses her legs, and then they do the, the, the starting lineups over the PA. It hasn't changed. It hasn't changed ever since she got here and it's not going to change unless something drastic happens. And you can go and look at the, you know, USC games. You can go look at all these other games that happened in the Elite Eight. Nobody's there on the court for the National Anthem. But, you but also LSU's nitpick. getting the beaten. LSU's yeah. the one getting the beaten. You have to nitpick somebody like LSU when you have such big prominent names in it, like Kim Mulkey, Angel Reese, Lassie Johnson, Haley Van Lith. Like, it's really just the media trying to stir something into what it's not when you and I and everybody else covers the team knows what the protocols have been ever since she got here. 12-minute mark, go back into the locker room. It's been the same way every single time. but. You know, it, it is what it is, and uh, people are going to try to tear down somebody like Kim Mulkey, who's such a, like I said a minute ago, prominent figure in the basketball space, and you just you got to do what you got to do. Haley Van Lith, what's going to happen? I'm super intrigued. Obviously, the 48-hour window passed last night at around roughly 8.30 p.m. Uh, for those who don't know, players who were going to declare for the WNBA draft had 48 hours after that loss to Iowa. We saw Angel Reese make her decision to go to the WNBA draft, and now all eyes are on what Haley Van Lith's going to do. Will she return to LSU? Will she go to the transfer portal? Or will she go pro? So it's a really interesting thing to look at. I'm not sure if she goes pro. I think the WNBA is just so hard to make a roster. We're going to have to sit. Time will tell. I think today will be decision day. but Or public announcement day because it's obviously whatever she's doing is already done. But it's hard to make a roster in the WNBA. And I think her best interest would potentially be to go into a system in college and try to play her game like she did at Louisville. But like I said, time will tell on this one. And by the way, it, if that happens, Zach, the transfer portal, then it's going to be another 48 hours of her leaving Mulkey and, and all that. It's it's coming. Um, all madness. It always is with LSU women's basketball, I swear. Yeah, but, you know, she's got a tricky situation. I asked uh, Haley um, when we had uh, in the locker room um, on a Saturday uh, at the Baton Rouge Regional Yeah, uh, about, you know, Look, she's a, she's a, I think she's wrapped up her masters. 
I mean, what does she do for courses? That that's that's another part of it where I kind of think that maybe she's heading to Europe. Um, but she does have one year of eligibility and she can transfer out and the NCAA doesn't uh you know, it seems like you can switch schools every year. They, you can just get waivers to do anything. You can transfer as many times as you want, it seems like, nowadays. But I really like what you said about potentially going to Europe and just starting her professional journey in some way, shape, or form. Because she said in her press conference during the NCAA tournament, in during the Baton Rouge Regional, rather, and she talked about how some people have a pro bag, some people don't have a pro bag. And she firmly believes that she does. And whether she gets her journey started in Europe or WNBA, whatever it is, she's a pro. And there's things in her game that, of course, need tweaking, just like everybody. But I, I think that if she elects to go to Europe, it could be in her best interest. But this is going to be a really interesting situation to see how it pays out or play, pays out. Yeah. LSU baseball, can they fix it? Look, I'll never doubt Jay Johnson. He's the best in the business, and I firmly believe that he'll get this team in check. Obviously, we saw all these different things that they're doing, whether it's no phones in the locker room or all these other different things where they're getting grounded, essentially. Um, and I really think that Jay Johnson is going to get this program back on track. Like I said, best in the business. He's got an excellent roster, super talented, just uber athletic guys in the outfield. It, it, it's going to be hard for them to not get back on track. So I think in baseball, you can get hot whenever you can. And I think towards the back end of the season, we'll see them get them back on track. But, you know, as they get to the point now, Zach, where you, if you don't get two out of three at Vanderbilt this weekend with, where, with, with you know, the middle part of, of the SEC and with the one loss record is, uh, th then you're, you're kind of too late. That's you know? what I, that's another thing too. Is it like, is it too little, too late type deal? And you have to win two out of three with Vanderbilt, like you were saying. So it, it doesn't cut it. The mediocrity isn't in Jay Johnson's vocabulary. So you got to go out here and get two out of three and then continue to trek in the right direction. But this weekend will be a super telling sign as to the direction that this program is going to go in towards the back end of the season. Well, I'm sure you're like me that uh, your biggest concern, I'm going back to football now, that the LSU football team's biggest worry is interior defensive line. Um, what is your second biggest worry on this LSU football team? Honestly, don't tell me, don't tell me punter. Absolutely not. I'll never go to special teams. You'll never, you'll never hear me talk about special teams. Um, I guess biggest worry would probably be where you go in the secondary solely because offensively you're just so sound. There's not a really a worry to me. Quarterback, you're done. Offensive line, check. Running back, check. Obviously you go get another running back in the spring portal window to add some depth. Wide receivers, an embarrassment of riches. You had Aaron Anderson running in the starting group today, and you have six or seven guys that can really go out there and make an impact. So for me, if I'm looking at a concern on this on this football team, it's going to be in the secondary, and it's really going to be what do you do at the cornerback position? Can you start a true freshman in the SEC if they go with P.J. Woodland? And that was something that you talked about a couple of minutes ago when we were just talking about, is him getting starting reps a telling sign of the talent in this roster or a telling sign of this cornerback room? So, yeah, what do you do in the cornerback room? That's my concern. Well – you brought up Aaron Anderson's name. I will say this. I know that he feels that uh, this is the best his knee has ever felt. And when I watch him on quick slants, he looks as crisp as I've seen him since he arrived in Baton Rouge. And um, I kind of like where that group's going. I, I mean, I think Kyron Lacey, you know, he can, he was, he's been aggravating at times the last uh, couple of years. Um, but from what I've seen, I'm not seeing some of that stuff where, you know, there's a drop, and then there's two fantastic circus catches. Uh, I'm seeing some real consistency out of him right now. Now, we're not there for the entire practice, and maybe in, in, in the later ends of parts of practice when you're tired and, and your mind starts to uh, uh, go down a little bit and, and focus, if, if that can rear its head a, a bit with him, that I don't know. But I like the way that's going. I like the fact that they're they're saying some they're starting to single out uh, Shelton Sampson. Uh, Joe Sloan did that uh, two days ago, and so I think that that uh, that room is going to be just fine. I'm not worried about anything on offense. Um, to me, it's it's still very much defense. We'll see what they get done in the portal. Um, what do you think? Another two or three uh, defensive tackles. The portal is going to be your best friend. I, I, th there's no way that you can go into this window and not get two or three guys. Three would be the best because you really only have four or five scholarship interior defensive linemen right now. And you flip one of them. It was an offensive lineman in chemo that you flipped to the defensive line. So he's still adapting that position. And he was taking first team reps today. So it's it's really going to be something. Yeah, to answer that question with a couple of words, you have to get two or three guys. Well, three. It, and look, we've seen it in the past where you've got defensive linemen that um, are really good for a dozen to 15, 16 plays for you in a game. And so there's some safety in numbers there. Um, 
you know, if you can get enough bodies there that, uh, and particularly some guys with experience, you can make a go of it as long as your linebackers are going to be as stout as uh, Blake Baker thinks that that group, I mean, Blake Baker's got some talented linebackers there. And then we'll see what they can come off the edge with. And and if Savion Jones is ready to, and Womack, et cetera, are ready to uh, step up uh, and, and, and be a little bit, uh, uh, more disruptive than than we than they have been. Uh, I like what I saw a little bit out of Womack last year, but um, there's a lot of ways to skin this cat, and I think they're going to figure it out. But th- they've got to get some bodies there uh, in 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 the next uh, couple of months. I completely agree. And on the, on the subject of Deshaun Womack, kind of just staying on the defensive line as a whole, I, I think this has to be a year where Deshaun Womack breaks out of his shell, and it's the perfect opportunity to. You're still lacking some depth on the edge right now. Obviously, Braden Swinson is running with the ones. Him and Savion Jones are kind of handling first-team reps right now. Deshaun Wilmex sliding in there a little bit. Jackson Howard sliding in there a little bit as well. So you have some talented edge rushers, but I, I think this has to be where you let Deshaun Wilmex eat. And I think this season is going to be where you see that. Just He's such a force, man. He's so disruptive. And like you said, in order for this team to shine, you need to get into the backfield. You need to have your defensive line do what they can. And I think Bo Davis is the perfect guy to get this team in check. So Spring portal window. It's gonna be fun to see what they do here. Well, you brought his name up. You brought his name up, Jackson Howard. I haven't seen him flash yet. Have you? I haven't seen too much from him, but man, I I, I want to believe he can get out of his shell sooner rather than later. He's such an interesting prospect because he's such a hybrid. Like he he can drop back in coverage if you need him to. And he was doing some drills on Tuesday where he was dropping back in coverage. But he's also so strong and powerful and so physically developed as a sophomore. Really a redshirt freshman, and he can just get into the backfield whenever you need him to. So. I really hope that he can break out of his shell, but no, I haven't seen too much. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to ask you this because, you know, he was obviously a tight end defensive end prospect and wanted to come in and, and get the opportunity to defensive end. I think he could be a force at tight end. At what point do you make, start to broach that subject if if he doesn't start making some flashes? You're, just talk, you're staying, talking about Jackson Howard? Yeah. I don't think he would succeed in this tight end room just because you're so dang loaded. You have Mac Markway who's shining with the twos, Mason Taylor, Camorian Pimpton. You're bringing in Trey Des Green. It, he just would get buried on that depth chart as well. His bread and butter is going to be as an edge rusher. It's just a matter of if he can get it all fundamentally sound in time. Well, I'd like to see him do it. Uh, he's super kid, highly intelligent. His dad, obviously a former NFL player. Um, and like you said, uh, what a talent he was because, you know, half and half uh the schools that were at offered him scholarships uh would have taken him on either side of the ball um he was just such a tremendous get he was the number one player in minnesota and for brian kelly to go up north and steal a recruit like that was a tremendous was just a huge deal and so like you said it's just he had offers he could have gone wherever he wanted to play but he came down here so i really hope he can get it together all right well the smoky investment team practice reports in the books go check out uh zach um, on X, he's at Z Nagy, Z N A G Y 20. Uh, go give him a follow on Twitter, uh, slash X. And of course, uh, LSU uh, country on SI he does a, a great job. And of course he's always, uh, with Preston during the football season. And, and, uh, and I'm glad, uh, to have him with us today, but anything you want to see on the way out? That's all, man. I really appreciate you having me on. Obviously let's do it again. Big Mike. All right, man. Talk soon. Thanks, Zach. Let's do it.